Hey, so I know um, when I put a title for men only, it's kind of inviting women to watch it. <laughs> uh, kind of like if you're walking down the road and there's a, you know, say a construction site with a big wooden fence and there's, there's a hole in it, you're going to walk by and not even think twice. But if there's a big sign, do not look through this hole. <laughs> Every one of us is going to look through the hole. Just our human nature. So this is specifically for men. If there's any women watching, I just want to forewarn you. Uh, I'm talking to men like men talk to men. Uh, I have four sons, uh, have many friends, and when we talk about things in life, like today specifically, I wanna talk about marriage, single men, and raising children. Uh, this is how I would say it, I would just uh, shoot straight, say what I mean, mean what I say, try not to say it mean. However, ladies may find it a little insensitive. Conservative ladies may find it a little insensitive. Liberals may find this toxic max masculinity. <laughs> but um, I'm just speaking the truth. I, uh, for the record, I'm not a clergy. I'm not a deacon. I'm not a priest. This is just a blue collar guy talking man to man. If I offend anyone, I apologize. But I'm shooting it straight the way I see it from the Bible shooting it straight from what the way I believe the church teaches us and just being honest um, with my experience. Now, like I said, I'm not clergy. Uh, I also never attended college, so this isn't gonna be some college psych course. My credentials are I've been married 36 years to the same woman. I have five grown children that have children of their own. They all love the Lord uh, and we're a very close family. So that's all I have to offer. I've made a lot of mistakes, um, but like any good coach knows, teams learn more from losing than they do from winning. So I'm gonna share what I've learned through my mistakes, and I've done some things right, and I'll share that as well. Now two of my grandsons uh, are two years old, and when I chase them, they run, but their instinct is to, to grab a toy machine gun and turn around and shoot me. <laughs> I call those two guys snipers and diapers. <laughs> I love my little snipers and diapers to death. Uh, but it just shows you that our innate is to be warriors. God cre cre created us men to be warriors. And, you know, my last job before COVID... I was a milkman, and I would uh, go on, I think it was Tuesday mornings, about 2 o'clock, between 2 and 3 a.m., I always hit this same convenience store, because you run a route. And there was a guy, I guess about 40, and I used to always talk to him, because there would be nobody in the store at that time, and as I'm, you know, loading up the milk in his cooler, or checking him in, we, you know, we talk, and we became friends, real nice guy. But one day, he's like sharing his problems, and... Um, Basically, you know, he was feeling bad because he's worried that he, the new owner was going to let him go, fire him. And, uh, you know, he's lonely, hasn't had a girlfriend in years. And as this guy is telling me this, tears are coming out of his eyes. And the, the movie scene from The Godfather just kept popping in my head where uh, Johnny Fontaine, the singer, is supposed to be like Frank Sinatra or Frankie Valli or somebody... Uh, is telling the Godfather he don't know what to do. He needs this movie part, and the producer won't give him the part, and he starts crying. So the Godfather gets up and slaps him. In, <laughs> the Godfather slaps him in the face and says, "You can start acting like a man. That's what you could do. You go out to Hollywood and you become a little baby." Ooh! And you know, it's the Godfather. Uh, and then Johnny Fontaine's, you know, wiping his eyes, and and uh, one of the Godfather's other sons come in, uh, Sonny, who was being unfaithful to his wife. And as the Godfather's giving uh, manly advice to Johnny Fontaine, he looks over at his son and he says, uh, well, first he says to Johnny Fontaine, do you spend time with your family? And Johnny says, yes, Godfather, I spend a lot of time with my family. He said, good, because you can't be a real man. And he looks at his son who's being unfaithful to his wife and says, you can't be a real man if you don't spend time with your family. Great lesson, Godfather 101. Uh, act like a man and spend time with your family. And as I 
as I go and I meet these guys as the years go on, and I've been running routes for years, you know, different companies, you know, uh, worked for a milk company. I, I picked up body parts. <laughs> now I'm delivering bang energy drinks. Um, long story short, I meet more and more men that are snipers and diapers. These are grown men that inside there's a warrior fighting to come out, but our culture has intimidated them. Our culture has told them they got to stay in diapers. They got to be feminine. They got to be sensitive. They got to be weak. And, you know, as this guy in this convenience store is crying to me, I'm, I'm thinking in my head, if I slap him and tell him to man up, I'll probably lose my job. <laughs> so instead, I'm like, bro, first of all, I know the owner of this store because I deliver on Fridays later in the day when he's here. He loves you. You're not getting fired, first off. For, nobody wants to work overnight to begin with, and you never call out. You never have... Uh, shortage on the money, you're not going nowhere. So he's like, oh, thanks. He really said that. I said, yeah, he really said that. I said, second of all, stop acting like a man. No girl, you're not going to get any girl if you're all whiny and crying. And he's like, oh no, girls like sensitive guys. And I said, no, they don't. <laughs> That's a lie. <laughs> That's a lie. Girls want strong men, not cocky, douchey, douchey guys. They want strong men, confident men that'll take care of them. I mean, we're called. We're called to be like Jesus. So let's see how Jesus calls us to act and how Jesus act. So we'll start off. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Oh, man, my, my notes are terrible. For, uh, Ephesians 5.25. Okay, this is St. Paul talking to the church of Ephesus. 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We got to be willing to die for our wives. You know, most of us live in countries where we're not going to be martyred. But if we did, we would die before our wives. That's what we're called. That's the Christian calling. But in everyday life in America or most of Europe, you don't have to worry about being martyred for Christ yet. But Christ calls us to die to ourselves. I mean, I was getting annoyed. I wanted to make this video yesterday. And I wanted to make it earlier today. And um, there was things my wife wanted to do. And this is, and, and I'm not, she's not like bossing me around. And I'm not out of weakness saying, okay, dear, let's go do it. Out of strength, I'm like, okay. Christ calls me to die for my wife. The least I can do is if she needs to go to the store after mass and wants me to go with her, I can go with her and I can do this later. And, you know, yesterday it actually worked out good. I had a, we had a lot of stuff I had to take to the dump and, and to the uh, donate to the thrift store. And uh, by the time I got done with that, I had to take a shower because we had plans to take our grandkids and some of our kids went along with us to the movies. And what a trade off, you know. I was blessed. And, and these are the fruit when you're faithful to God and his ways. And again, I, you know, I, I don't do everything right. But I try to put my wife and my kids first. And, you know, we used to take our kids to the movies. You know, CG movies, something clean. And it was nice. And then we got, they got older, we missed it. But then um, they got to an age where they got older and they wanted to be with us. You see? And... We started going as couples with them, as friends, as equals. And then they had little kids and they were like babies. You couldn't take babies in the movies. But now, like, my grandkids are all like two through ten. And they can all, we can all go together. So again, it's like marriage is the gift that just keeps giving. God just keeps blessing us. And, it, you know, we take up like three rows, but it's fun. And, and the grandkids have a blast. And uh, it, it just brings us closer. And we come home and we eat. I didn't get to do my video, but... What a blessing. So when Christ says, be willing to die for your wife, I don't think he always means, I mean, yes, we got to take a bullet for him if it comes down to that. We got to be warriors. We can't be snipers and diapers. We got to be snipers. And um, in fact, you know, 
just, just uh, I'm going to digress a little bit. I, it just came to me. I should make little t-shirts. I, I think I still have my uh, blue collar Catholic shop. I, I should check. I don't know when YouTube demonetized me, they might've shut it down because I haven't heard nothing from them yet. But, but uh, if they haven't uh, taken my shop down, I'll make some little diaper, uh, sniper with diapers uh, shirts you can get for your grandkids. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, the point I'm making is, you know, Christ wants us to die for our wives every day. And, you know, getting back to the guy that said, um, you know, oh, girls want us to be sensitive. They don't. They really don't. <laughs> Not in that way. They want us to be sensitive to them when they cry. Understand why they're crying. Ask them why they're crying. Try and minister to them. They don't want to have to wipe our tears. Trust me. <laughs> but... But you say, well, how, you know, some guys just cry easier. I mean, I cry if I watch a touching movie. I cry easy, you know, I'm not. But how do we be strong like Jesus? You spend time with Jesus. My non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters, brothers that are watching this, you know, you spend time in, your word, in the Word. Ask God to fill you with His Holy Spirit to give you faith so you, you, you don't get scared, you know. Faith over fear, you know. If you have faith, you won't be as fearful. Now, my Catholic brothers, we're so blessed we have that. We can get the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We have the Bible. We can read it every day. But we have something even greater. <laughs> we have the Holy Eucharist. Make sure you don't miss Mass. Try and get the daily Mass. Get that Eucharist to strengthen you, to give you the faith. Because if you remember, when Jesus was on that boat in the storm and, and all the apostles were scared and they're waking up, Jesus, Jesus, aren't you afraid? What did Jesus say to them? Ye of little faith. Don't be scared. So, if you don't have faith, you're going to be scared. So you want to be brave and strong like Jesus and be called to be the warrior your wife wants you to be. You need faith. And how do we get faith? By grace. But, and where do we get the grace? From the Eucharist, from the Holy Spirit, from all the sacraments, from prayer. So we constantly have to be with the strong one, Jesus. And, you know, you become who you hang out with. If you're hanging out with Jesus every day, you become more and more like him. And Jesus just got up calmly and calmed the storm. And they said, wow, who is this that even the winds obey? And it reminds me when I first uh, became a born-again Christian, I was, you know, evangelical born-again Christian. I come out of boot camp, and my brother hears I'm a born-again Christian. And, you know, God rest his soul. Uh, he's in heaven, um, Lord willing. He says to me, uh, you know, I'm glad you got your life together, you know, you got it all together now, because if you watch Breaking Bad, you know, selling drugs at age 12, he said, but uh, if I see you selling flowers on the corner with the Moonies, I'm going to kick your butt. And I was like, whoa, bro, my God's no wimp. I'm like, my God walks on water. My God raises the dead to life. You know, I went on and on, he's like, okay, calm down, calm down, I get it. I'm like, bro, my God is no wimp. And our God doesn't want his men to be wimps, especially in these times. You know, where the whole world is trying to feminize us. The whole world is trying to take away our masculinity. The whole world doesn't want their... God created man and woman. And the world is saying, no, God just created this mix. Some kind of hodgepodge person who's not a man or a woman. No, God created man and woman. And he wants men to be men and women to be women. Now, that doesn't mean you uh, men are better than women. It just means we're different. God chose a woman come to this earth. God chose Mary to be the greatest saint of all. She outranks all of us. She outranks Peter. She's way above St. Paul. She's, she's above everyone. She's above all the angels. The only person she's below is the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God chose a woman, Mary Magdalene, to be the first person to see him raised from the dead, which... Uh, if you're into apologetics, it's a great apology to people that say the Bible's made up. Because if they just want to make up a story that Jesus rose from the dead, they wouldn't say a woman found him. Because back then, before Christ, women were not considered a valid witness. See, not only did Jesus split time in half, A.D. and B.C., Jesus changed and elevated how the world treats women. Even in non-Christian countries, women are still treated bad. If you look in the Muslim and Hindu countries, they're not treated as good as Christian women in Christian countries. So any feminist watching, watching, you should thank 
Christianity for elevating women. Jesus said there's no longer no Jew nor Greek nor male nor female. We're all equal in the sight of God. And this is why women's lives improved when Christianity came on the scene. And, you know, some Christians, unfortunately, uh, take verses out of context. And some atheists take verses out of context. And one in particular is right before uh, Jesus said, husbands, love your wives. There's this verse. Uh, back it up uh, to uh, Ephesians 5, 23. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. Some verses says, wives, submit to your husbands. And everybody's like, oh, that's awful. You know, people believe that. You know, and the wife goes around like a little uh, puppy, you know, getting ordered around by their husbands. But if you read the Bible in context, just one verse before that, it tells us husbands to submit to our wives. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then it goes on and explains what that means. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His body and himself is Savior. As the church is subject to Christ. So let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Now... What's the husband's job? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So they're calling us both in a loving, consensual way to submit to one another, to put each other's needs in front of each other. But when it comes down to it, the man has the greater responsibility because when it comes down to it, the man has to die for his wife like Christ died for the church and he gives an order but it doesn't make one better than the other you know a C a CEO of a company makes less decisions than the vice president or the president or the people that run day-to-day -day operations but at the end of the day if the company fails who's responsible the CEO so God is giving us that responsibility if our family fails we're ultimately responsible. You know, when I was, uh, you know, a young Christian in my 20s, I had a friend of mine say, oh, you let your wife do the bills. You know, you, you know, you're supposed to be the head of the house. Well, you should do it. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you shouldn't give her that worry. It's worrying when you're paying the bills, you know. Because like I said before, I don't have a college degree, but I did earn a PhD when I first went in the Navy. I was poor, hungry, and desperate. <laughs> I was poor, hungry, and desperate until I made petty officer. So <clears throat> it was very worrisome trying to juggle the bills, you know, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, as they say. <clears throat> but then I, as I got older, especially with paying stuff online, which drives me crazy, my wife said, you know, I could help you if you want to pay the bills. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And it turns out, lo and behold, she's much better at it than me. We always have more money left over than when I did it. So... You know, we have different gifts. It doesn't make her the boss over me telling me how to spend my money. Just like when I did the bills, it made me the boss over her. In fact, she makes most of the decisions about spending the money, you know, because she's running the household, you know. People, women that go out to work, they don't understand a stay-at-home mom is like a CEO of a company. I mean, they have to run everything. There's a lot of responsibility. They have to be orderly. And I'm not very organized. So, you know, all those years... You know, I was behind on all the bills. If I would have just asked my wife to do it, we'd probably be better off. So being the leader of your house doesn't mean that you lord over them, you know. And, and the Bible even says, St. Paul says, do not lord over those under you. You know, so so that, you know, that that's for that. Then, um, you know, I'm, you might be watching and saying, you know, I'm going through a rough time. Um you know, I know you've been married 36 years, you don't understand, you know, I think it's best me and my wife divorce, you know, but you're Catholic, so you don't know what to do, because Catholics teach that what God put together, no man should separate, we don't believe in divorce, you know, Protestants, when I was an evangelical, we had a loophole, <laughs> and I'll get to that in a minute, and a lot of uh, Protestants will use this loophole, but God hates divorce. And if you're going through a rough time, I'm not here preaching to you like I'm this perfect husband. Like I said, I've made a lot of mistakes. 
And after being married 20 years, I loved my wife more than ever. She was more beautiful to me than she ever was. And she told me she didn't love me. And we got separated. We didn't get divorced, but we got separated. And we were separated for several months. And when she told me that, I acted like a sniper in a diaper. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, you know. Like I said, I'm not preaching you, telling you I'm perfect. And everything I'm telling you, I practice 100%. My faith was weak. We were at a church. And I didn't have that faith that only comes from being close to Jesus. You know, I wasn't even Catholic, so I didn't even have the Eucharist feed in me. I was totally out of church for like a year. And not because we were like backslidden. We, we just... I got busy, you know, I started working and, you know, Protestants don't look at going to church like Catholics do. Like we have to be fed. We have to have that Eucharist every week. They look at it like you're just going to hear a motivational preacher and praising the Lord and learning the Bible. So it was no big deal. I felt like as the head of the household, I had to work a second job and, you know, I was working like 80 hours a week. And, you know, people were telling me, you know, you guys have been together since you're 13. I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but... You know, she's been my girl since I'm 13. We got married at 19 and, you know, 20 years of marriage, five kids later, she, you know, burnt out, whatever it was. Uh, she felt like she didn't love me. And, and it wasn't until I stopped acting like a sniper in a diaper and just started acting like a sniper for Lord, for the Lord. And I started praying and, and crying to him. And that's another thing. It's not good to cry to your wife, but Jesus shows us the example who to cry to the night before he was about to be crucified, he went into the garden and he cried so intensely. He said he cried tears of blood. Cry to the Father. Get alone with God every day and cry to him like Jesus did. And you know, and I'm not saying never cry. I mean, when Jesus found out his friend Lazarus was dead, it said Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. If you ever played Bible trivia, shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. So there's times we do cry. When I say don't whine, you don't cry like, oh, my job is so hard, oh, this is, the bills are getting too much, oh, the kids are out of control. No, you're the man. Act like a man. And God will give you the strength to be like the greatest man that ever lived, Jesus Christ. But you have to be close to him, to know him, to be like him. You can't be like someone you don't know, you know? So, again, I knew in my heart I didn't want to divorce my wife because... You know, like I always say, don't marry the person you can live with. Marry the person you can live, you can't live without. And I knew I couldn't live without her. But you have, sometimes you have no control. So I just started praying every night, every day, continuously praying. And it was when I backed off and just let her go. You know, like that old saying, you know, let the bird go. If it comes back, it was yours. If it doesn't, it never was, whatever, you know. But it's just, just common sense. You know, until she had space to realize that she did love me. And there was a reason we've been together since we're 13. And there was a reason we were married for 20 years. She came back to me. And maybe we were separated six months at the most, like not living together. Uh, but even before that, living at home, you know, not getting along. And, you know, and maybe a year total. You know, that was 16 years ago, 15 years ago. And now neither one of us could ever imagine not being together. We couldn't imagine not having our grandchildren here every day. And you know, like I said, yesterday we were at the movie theater together. Today we're in mass together. These are the blessings. If you hang on like a pit bull and you know, and God hates divorce. And, and like I said, Protestants unfortunately see this loophole, you know, because they, they don't believe in the authority of the church. Just what the Bible says, that's it. And they're their own interpreters of the Bible. Unfortunately, they interpret things wrong a lot. So here's the teaching Jesus gave on divorce, Matthew 19, 3 to 9. And, Fa and Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking. Okay, so they're trying to get him caught going against the law of Moses. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? So he's quoting, so... They're quoting the law to Jesus, and Jesus is quoting scripture back to him. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. So they are no longer two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. They said to him, why then did Moses... 
command one to give her a certificate of divorce to put her away. And he said to them, for your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for unchastity, which most uh, versions will say adultery, that's what he means, and marries another, commits adultery. And he who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So the Catholic t Church teaches you can't get unmarried because you didn't marry yourself. God married you. So if God married you and he hates divorce, you can't get divorced. But if the context of this is if you do get divorced based on some certificate, some legal thing, don't remarry. Because then you'll be committing adultery. Because in the eyes of God, you're still married. And this is the Catholic teaching right here in Scripture. Now, I said I would talk about single men. And my only credential, I've been married more than I've been single in my life. I'm 55, I've been married 36 years. But I can give you advice on marriage. Because I've been following, I'm being, I'm sorry, I'm being single. Because I've been following Jesus Christ for 36 years. And Jesus was single when he was on this earth. And St. Paul was single. So I spend time with Jesus and I read the words of St. Paul. And this is what I come up with. If you just go down. The disciples, this is verse 10. Matthew 19, 10. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is not expedient to marry. It's like... You can't divorce your wife for no, no matter what. They got it. They, they didn't take him out of context. But if you can't divorce your wife, it's better not to get married. And Jesus' reply was, Not all men can receive this precept, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth. So a eunuch is an old word. Just uh, There are men that were castrated. Some were castrated at birth. Um... Uh, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And a lot of like uh, kings would have their guards uh, guard their wives. So to play it safe, they would castrate them. And then, and then there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. He who is able to receive this, let him receive this. Now, I don't want to be irreverent, but again... To let guys understand what I'm talking about. Before I was a Christian. Like I said before I was a Christian. I used to tell this joke. Uh, about my managers. And I used to make my co-workers laugh, laugh. I'd say. Man this manager is about as useless at a eunuch. At the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> so it's kind of kind of vulgar. And, and irreverent. But like I said I was a non-Christian. But it's just kind of the, the guys that are watching. That don't understand what a eunuch is. I just want to get that point across. That's what a eunuch is. And Jesus is saying that there are some eunuchs who have chosen for the kingdom of heaven. Let him who can receive it. So to be single is not a bad thing. If you're a single man, you need to pray and ask, does God want you to choose to be single and, and being single and, and Christian means to be celibate, not to have sex. And, you know, St. Paul, St. Paul in first Corinthians, uh, says this about being single, uh, first Corinthians seven, 32 to 40. I want you to be free from anxieties. <laughs> The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord. How to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly affairs. How to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried woman or virgin is anxious about the affairs of the Lord. How to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly affairs. How to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit. Not to lay any restraint upon you but to promote good order. So like if, if you're single and you're on fire for the Lord, there's so much more you can do than us married guys. Like, you know, like I said, yesterday I was planning on doing this video and then doing one or two more today for the glory of God. 
But he's not saying it's a bad thing. He's just saying it's the way it is. You have to please your wife if you're married. You divide it. So celibacy isn't a bad thing. And then um, right before that, um, oh no, I'm sorry. Okay, right after that, I'm sorry. The, the glare is kind of hurt because I got things highlighted. So we'll keep going, 36. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry, it is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So that he who marries his betrothed does well and he who refrains from marriage will do better. So God is saying those who can control their desires, control their passions, control their lusts, to say it clearly, this is better not to be married. Now, we think of celibacy, you know, in our culture as, as, as maybe weak or feminine. And Jesus, the most masculine man that ever lived, is saying, this is strong, this is better. I'm sorry, this is St. Paul. I'm sorry, St. Paul is saying this. But Jesus also stayed single because they had their passions. Even though Jesus was God and man, he was fully man when he was on earth and fully God. But he controlled his passions and never sinned. And St. Paul is saying... Control your passions. He's describing celibacy as manly, as strong, as masculine. You know, this is why we're taught to fast, to control our desires. If you can fast, then you, control, then you can control your flesh. You're more of a spiritual man. You're strong. You're strong in the Lord. So, you may be called a singlehood. And don't think of it as a curse, like that guy in that convenience store did. Think of it as a blessing. You can do so much more than I can do for the Lord. Believe me, you can do so much more. And then if you're called to the priesthood, we just had a priest on uh, Father Mike a couple days ago. Watch that video and see what you could do as a priest. And I, I've spoken to a couple other priests that I'm going to have in the future. And these are excited on fire priests. And I admire them. I'm, I'm, you know, when I first came back to the Catholic Church, I fully didn't understand the priesthood. There was a lot of apologetics I learned that convinced me, but mainly the Eucharist. But the priesthood, I, I'm still learning, and I'm, you know, and that's why I'm inviting these priests on to teach me more. Because as you're learning, I'm learning as well. But one thing I'm learning about the priesthood, God can use a good priest. I mean, priests have so many gifts. I mean, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. I wish I could be a priest. I really do. And if you're single, pray and discern. God needs good priests. The church needs good holy men, masculine men, men of God, warriors, snipers, not snipers and diapers. We need good godly men to fight the good fight and to lead us in the battle, teach us, train us up. And uh, getting, back, getting back to fatherhood. I have five kids and they all love the Lord. We're close, we're tight. They all have their families, they're good parents. I'm very proud. But the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child. Most people know that verse. We have to discipline our children. And I was always kind of weak. I was always the guy they can, you know, charm. And, you know, I was more of the hugs and kisses, affectionate. I want to go play ball. I, had the, I was the fun dad. My wife was the disciplinarian. And that's great when they're little, but when they're teenagers, a man has to man up. And I remember, you know, my one son getting in trouble and actually being in juvenile court. And I'm thinking, man, Lord, this is like me, you know. <laughs> I thought my kids would be spared this. You know, I taught them about the Lord. My wife homeschooled them, and now I'm in juvenile court. And I remember waiting for a lawyer to come, and I said to my son, you know, you'd make a good lawyer. And I never really thought about it until years later, he passed his bar on the first try and became a lawyer and said, Dad, you know what made me think about becoming a lawyer? That day you told me I would be a good lawyer. And I was just blessed because, I, you know, like I said, I made a lot of mistakes as a dad and as a husband. But that was one thing I did right. And I always knew this, Colossians 3.21. A lot of dads overlooked this verse. 
And he's saying it specifically to fathers because, you know, fathers, we are warriors and we tend sometimes to be harsh. You know, I could have very easily say, man, we homeschooled you. We, my, you know, mommy gave up her career, gave up everything, gave up going to school to train you up. She stayed home every day with you. And, th and this, you walk away and, you know, you're getting in trouble. And now we're paying for a lawyer. We got to worry about you getting a record. But I remember Colossians 3.21, fathers, not fathers and mothers, fathers, listen up. Do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. If you're constantly on your kid with negativity, they're going to become discouraged. Speak words of life. I told my son you would make a good lawyer, and now he's a lawyer, and he's a good lawyer. And he's a good dad, and I'm proud of him. But there's many of you watching that you're like, my life is such a wreck. I've been married, divorced, remarried. You know, my life is just tangled up in knots. Well, I got good news for you. Our Blessed Mother Mary is an expert at untangling knots. Ask Mary to pray for you that your knots may be untangled, that Jesus Christ will send his Holy Spirit to show you clearly your path to take. And I said, God gave us a priesthood. Go to your parish priest and tell him, I want to get right with God, but these are my tangles. And have faith in God's grace that he loves you so much that while you were yet a sinner, while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Don't try and get it all together and then come to Christ. Let Christ get it all together for you. And then be a warrior, be a sniper for Christ, and, and do what you know is right in your heart, whatever it is. Thank you. Uh, may God bless you. Stay Catholic.